Okay, you guys. Oh my goodness, do, are there a lot of slides in today's presentation? So I always get so like, oh my God, I'm gonna have time to get through all this. And then I get nervous and then I talk too much and then I don't have enough time to get through it. So I'm gonna try and stay very focused because and not talk on each slide. I'm just gonna tell you the stuff and move on. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, so um, I did wanna quickly just say a few things. I made a very small change in the, um, the schedule, nothing that affects assessment, but on, uh, on the 9th, so today we're talking about panoramic radiology. Next Tuesday, we're gonna talk about the anatomy of intraoral films and dental materials. So recognizing anatomy from PAs and, and then dental anatomy. And then on week nine, so did I say week nine? So week eight, we talked about that. Week nine, we're gonna kind of bring it all together in like a review activity where I'm just gonna like rapid fire images and maybe I'll try and like get you into teams and maybe there'll be a prize. It will do something fun depending on time um, to get kind of bring all the anatomy together because the following week is the landmark exam which is an imaging exam and you fill in the blank. So you have to name the, the item you see and you have to write in the name of it. Um, so we're gonna get you good and ready for that. That'll be on week 10. Um, there is a quiz week nine and week eight. But so what I had for this week nine was just, just bringing the anatomy together. But I was noticing that I had this special imaging lecture kind of tucked way in at the um, after a mini exam at the end of the, toward the end of the semester. And I just thought, you know, after that mini exam, I just feel like it'd be nicer to be like, goodbye, we can go, you know, instead of staying for lecture. I just feel like that would feel more like a special reward or something. I'm like, I bet. And so I said, let's just move this lecture up. It's not going to be very long. It's mostly going to be talking about CBCT. And so, um, it, which is like 3D imaging. So I moved that up. So just wanted you to make note of that. And that really was the only, that really is the only change. I just wanted to make note of that. And then also to notice that in the clinic, uh, the labs, I mean, um, if we scroll down, if I can find my thing here. Um, where is it? Oh, here it is. So on week 10, um, on week 10, when you're in lab, you're gonna have your third Dexter FMX assignment, which is a full FMX. So this week you're doing the half of an FMX. This week 10, you're gonna do a full FMX. So that's what you'll do in the operatory. And then at the table, I'm basically gonna lecture a little bit. I'll have activities. It'll be like an informal um, on occlusal technique and traditional film. I really wanted to minimize traditional film. Like it's a fairly lengthy lecture, but it's so irrelevant. And you probably will just maybe see one or two questions on um, the national board, if even that. I mean, they do say they still test on it. So I'm just trying to kind of reduce it so it doesn't take up this huge amount of time. So we're gonna go over that when you're when we're at table time, because there are a few key points to pick up um, that perhaps could show up on a national board. So just wanted to make note of that. This table work is actually gonna be like kind of lecturing and we'll, and some maybe some handouts we'll work through or something. So I just wanted to do that. Um, so I'm gonna close this out and then I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoint for today. Uh, you may notice too that when I recorded the um, last week's lecture, it's kind of cut short. So I went all the way through till the break and then the rest of it is like not there. So I'm just gonna re-record that. That was, uh, we were talking about traditional film errors is that mm -hmm. that was the part that got cut off. Um, so I'm gonna just re-record it and um, post it um, as soon as I get around to it. Um, okay, so let me pull this up here. Okay, so panoramic radiographs is what we're going to talk about today. These are the objectives for the um, for the lecture. Um, and so we are want to know, think about like what a, a panoramic radiograph actually is. So it's an extraoral film. The film and the sensor are both outside of the mouth. 
It's an extra oral radiograph film located outside the mouth. There's advantages and disadvantages. Advantages are that it increases the coverage of the dental arch. So we can see a far greater um, amount of anatomy than we can with just a single film. It captures things like the temporal mandibular joint. It captures the maxillary sinuses um, and then the broad area of the jaw. So for fractures or you know, some kind of pathology or developmental, like what teeth are coming in, um, there is less radiation than an FMX. So you don't have to really feel guilty about taking, say you have to take four bite wings and a couple PAs, and then all of a sudden you realize, no, I need an FMX. You don't really have to feel bad about like radiating them with all those different things because there is less um, radiation than an FMX. The disadvantage is there's less detail. So it's everything is sort of, you can think of it about it as like farther away. So there's just less detail. You're not going to substitute um, a pano for an FMX. You're not going to get the same detail for detecting caries or um, bone level. So the, you, you lose detail. Um, so it's not a substitute there. And then the uses, um, kind of like I said a little bit, to examine areas like the TMJ um, or the skull to locate lesions in the jaws or the sinuses or if someone has a fracture to evaluate the eruption pattern. So where teeth are, if there's um, missing teeth, congenitally missing teeth, or where they are in the arch, um, if they're impacted, to locate the position of impacted teeth or lack thereof, preferred radiograph for edentulous patients. So if somebody is um, fully edentulous, you'd take a pano on them. Well, edentulous is like no teeth, so that's what that means. Um, and then may be used as a last resort for patients who can't tolerate. We tend to kind of want to lean on this and go, I'm just going to take a pano. Um, you know, the first sign of somebody gagging, um, and it's true, it's a, it is a good last resort, but there are other things that we can try to do first to get a patient through an FMX, even if they're gagging, um, but it is, it is a, a good option if there's nothing else. Panoramic and four bite wings is considered an FMX for insurance, so they'll bill it out as an FMX if someone has four bite wings and a pano. Okay, so some basic principles. Um, this is, if you, if we if we end up with a good pano, if the image is, is what we want, these are the criteria that will be present. All teeth are gonna be in focus and in the correct proportion. So we can have things, teeth can get large looking, teeth can get shrunken, teeth can get blurry, teeth can get spread out, you know, or so we want them all to be in focus and in the correct proportion. The occlusal plane should be a gentle smile. So you wanna remember that just a gentle smile. We're not looking for flat or inverted or like severe. We just want a very gentle smile line. Um, there should be good contrast um, and good density. And then you wanna keep the roots of the maxillary teeth, the apices should be, would be below the palatal line or else the palate's gonna obscure them. Um, so they should be well below. And if you have the patient position well, then their, their apices of their maxillary roots should be below the palatal line. Um, and you don't want any, any artifacts. And artifacts could be earrings, a denture left in, eyeglasses, hearing aid, things like that. So you don't want any artifacts. Uh, panoramic radiograph. So what's unique about this technique? What's unique is that it goes on for lo a lot longer than, you know, one, an intraoral film, you push the button and it's like, you know, fraction of a second. This goes on for 15 to 20 seconds and both the sensor and the film rotate around the patient's head. So as, as the sensor or as the film is rotating in one direction, then we have the um, source or the actual beam of radiation going around the head. So it rotates like this together. Um, so the jaw is scanned by a beam um, a little bit at a time. And so it kind of does it in segments and then puts the whole picture together. And it takes about 15 to 20 seconds. Um, it's a 3D horseshoe-shaped region called the focal trough or the image layer. So the only area that's in focus is called the, um, the focal trough, and it's like shaped like a horseshoe to try and fit in the jaw. Um, so that's, you got to position the patient in that viewing area. If you're too far forward or you're too far back or you're kicked off to one side, you're going to get distortion. So there, you want to be in the focal trough. And then the rest of the patient's head is sort of blurred out. So it's just focusing on that one area. So the focal trough, you can see an image of it here. 
Um, it's like this kind of horseshoe area. And it's the only region that'll be in focus. It's narrower at the anterior and it's wider at the posterior. Um, and then it's critical that the patient's teeth are located inside, like I said, or else you're gonna get distortion. You're gonna get enlarged um, teeth will get larger than they really are, or they'll get shrunken smaller than they are. Um, placement of anterior teeth is particularly important and patient positioning is crucial. And we'll talk more about how to position the patient later. Um, understanding the panoramic image. So both the film and the source move around the patient's head to produce the most accurate image. We already said this. And most and must understand how image is made to interpret it properly. So a lot of times when you look at a pano, it, it, it especially if you've never, I mean, I understand there's a lot of dental assistants in here. And so you've looked at lots of panos, but if you've never looked at one before, it can kind of throw you as to like what you're even looking at. It takes a little while to become really comfortable to like see the image. And then once you do, it's the same image just on different people. So there's anatomy variations and quality variations, but it's the same basic image over and over again. So you, you'll get used to it quickly. It just takes a while to, you know, you just have to see lots of different panos. Um, so then this is, again, describing how it rotates around. So you have your source of your x-ray on one side, and then you have the film on the other, and then it just, they rotate together. Um, the source is, um, it's at a um, kind of an upward trajectory. So the, the active, the primary beam kind of goes up through the occipital um, portion of the um, skull and kind of goes slightly upwards. Um, this is for a traditional film. So we have digital, so we don't have to worry about putting the film in correctly, but you can very likely go work for a practice that still uses non-digital in for pano because pano machines are really expensive. And so they may have transferred over to digital for their intraoral films, but they might not have upgraded their pano machine. So, so that is far more likely to happen than for them to just not have digital at all um, because a pano machine is like, you know, a hundred grand or something. And I'm, I'm sure there are some that are cheaper, but in general, if you want a good one. And so it's a big investment for the dentist. So um, there's more of these out there. Um, so if it is a cassette, um, just some basics to know, they come in various sizes. They can be rigid, like a hard cassette that you pop open and slide in the film, or it can be kind of like a, in like a plastic sleeve that kind of wraps around a tube. Um, so it just depends. And you just learn what your office has. You know, whatever the equipment is, you just go in and learn it and you'll pick it up fast because you learn so much in two years, you can certainly pick up a panel machine in a day. Um, so the front side faces the patient, left or right must be marked. You have to know what's the left and the right. And it um, the, the film will be marked left and right. Um, and there um, there's no dot. So like, you know how there's a raised dot on our traditional little intraoral film, there's no dot on the panel. So usually it's embedded in the actual film that says left and right. Um, so there's an intensifying screen. It converts the x-rays to light and that actually helps to expose the film and that allows the radiation to be less. It amplifies the action of the x-ray, reduces radiation, lower resolution than an intraoral film. And that's why the picture is not as clear. Although I have to say there are some digital panels out there that are like fabulous. And you can even take, even ours does it. We've just never tried, which I would love to see what it looks like, but you can also take bite rings on a pano. Um, and I don't, you know, obviously you're not going to be able to probably open up all contacts. That's probably a, a, a downside, but a lot of these machines are set up to just do like the bite wing image. So they'll just do the sides and they won't do the whole thing. Um, and ours does it too. Uh, we've just never tried it. Uh, or I haven't anyways, maybe somebody has, but we haven't done it in our, our typical patients. Um, okay, so the structure of a pano, so um, is basically thinking of like your head split down the back and then folded flat. So you're thinking about like a curved image like a 3D curved image that you're looking at in 2D. So, you know, there's gonna be layers of things um, and then it's gonna, it brings your ramus and your condyle and the coronoid process, it brings all of that out um, and just flattens you out. So that's what you're looking at. And there's other, some there's some other things here that we'll get to, I'm not gonna jump ahead of myself. 
this is just an image showing how it projects around the mandible um, and how there can be at the midline in the center, um, your projection, you can get either a single image of something or you can end up getting a double image of something. And that, and we'll talk about what those some things are, what, where those areas are. But, and that's just because when the source comes around, it can end up hitting the same area twice. And so you end up with what's called a double real image. We'll talk more about that in a second. So the midline structures, this is kind of this shaded diamond area. This midline structure, um, this is the area where you're most likely to see the double real images. So it's, it's really there in that area. That's what it means by real, but you're seeing it like mirrored. You're seeing like a mirror of it. So you're seeing a double image of something that's really there. And examples of what that could be are the hyoid bone, the soft palate, and the hard palate. And there's a couple other areas too that, um, that this shows up. But those are some examples of a double real image. So here's another kind of image of what, it, what you're kind of seeing, the, the rounded 3D jaw sort of flattened out flat like this, it's kind of a weird image, but that's basically what it's, that's basically what's happening in the image. And then notice here how like something like the, the spine, clearly you only have one spine, but a lot of times it doubles it up and you get a little spine on either side. You don't really want to see the spine necessarily in the pano, but a lot of times you'll see a little bit of the spine. Okay, so some, some basic, um, some more basic concepts of the pano. So we have some more images here that are double real images. So um, not these panos are not super great. I mean, there's so much better quality out there now, but these are already kind of have these nice arrows. So one of these days I'll update this. But um, one of the first double real images um, that you see on almost all panos is the hard palette. And that's gonna be this white line that's above the maxillary uh, teeth. And you're actually seeing not just a double real image, but you're also seeing a ghost image. And we'll talk about what that is too. But that's this, this hard white line right through or radiopaque line right here through this area. Um, and you also end up seeing the soft palette that's coming off of the sides here. So you only have one soft palette going down the back of your throat, but it ends up showing it on both sides of the pano. You also can see the epiglottis, which is usually above the hyoid bone, and then the cervical spine twice. So those are some other areas that you will see a double real image. This is showing the cervical spine, a really, really clear picture of the spine on both sides, here and here. Now, um, now for the ghost image. So a ghost image is when you have something really dense show up um, in the picture. And it shows up in very specific cat in a very specific way that you need to remember for quizzes and exams. So I starred the slide. I think it'll come up here in a little bit. But when you get because of the way that it projects as it goes behind your head, the say somebody left their earrings in, it takes a picture of the earrings and then it projects it onto the other side of the film. And when it projects it onto the other side of the film, it projects it larger. So here we're looking, see this big C here? That's this earring here. So it projects it opposite, it projects it higher. Notice that this earring is higher. It's much larger and it's blurry. So, and we'll go over these characteristics again. So then on this side, we have this earring and its ghost image is over here. Again, it's larger, it's higher, um, and it's on the opposite side. Um, something else that we get is the ghost image of the palette. So you can kind of see on this image here, this lower line, this is your hard palette down here. And then you have the ghost image up here. So see how there's a little space between these two lines? That's the ghost image of this hard palette. And so vice versa. So the ghost image is always on the opposite side of the picture. Um, and then the other, the other area that you can get a ghost image is the border of the jaw, the border of the, the mandible. So it's a little hard to pick out, but see how there's this line running right here. And then this line turns and comes up. That's the border of the mandible for this side. So over here on this side of the film, 
the ghost image of that is right through here. And so it's picking up things that are denser. So for sure, like if somebody has a screw somewhere, you know, like they had a surgery and they have a screw or something that will be picked up on uh, earrings, you know, I'm trying to think of something else that might be left in hairpin or something, you know, but it has to be in a certain area still for the source to pick it up as it goes around. Okay, so the characteristics, so you want to memorize this for sure, they're larger, um, the ghost, the ghost image, not the original, but the ghost image is larger, it's blurrier, it's on the opposite side, it's higher, and it's close to the midline, that's the one I, I left off, and sometimes it doesn't it doesn't look that like super close to the midline, but it's closer to the midline than the original image. So if the, you know, the earring is going to be farther out and the ghost image is going to be closer to the midline. Okay, so here is another ghost image of the hard palette. And then um, the soft palette over here, we have, this is more of a double reel image. Um, but we have the soft palette and maybe it, they're, maybe they're saying that this actually can be a double real image, but also maybe it's um, twice as big because there's a ghost image there too. So I guess it's both. I guess you do get a ghost image of it. And then um, you can also see other soft tissue and cartilage outline. Um, sometimes you can see the earlobes. And this all depends on just how you position the patient. You're not always going to see the earlobes. You're definitely not always going to see the soft tissue of the nose, but sometimes you can, depending on where the patient is. Um, you may see soft tissue of the lips or the tongue, um, but not always. Again, it just sort of depends on how you position the patient and the patient's anatomy. Air spaces um, are another, another part of a pano that shows up very frequently. And we want to be really, really aware of air spaces because one air space in particular um, can obscure the apices of the maxillary teeth. And that's the palatoglossal air space. And that's the area in the palate. So palatoglossal, the palate. So that's how you can remember where that one is. Um, it's that air space is basically an air space that's created if the patient does not put their tongue on the roof of their mouth. So it's it's an airspace that's a little different from the other ones because the other ones are just part of like anatomy, the ones that come down the side of the pano, the nasopharyngeal is the next one that it's all kind of like comes in an arch. You'll and we'll go over these some more. This isn't the only time that we'll talk about it in this slide deck, but it all kind of ties together a little bit in sort of like an arch through the pano. And so the top one, the palatal glossal will show up if you didn't have your patient positioned right. And that's part of that is telling them where to put their tongue. But then the other two parts of the airspace is the nasopharyngeal and the oropharyngeal. And those are just natural anatomy. I mean, that's just part of anatomy. They can't do anything to get rid of those parts. Um, and so, you know, though that's the main difference between. So we talk about the palatal glossal being an error, a technique error, because as the clinician, you're going to have your patient put their tongue in a certain place and make it a really big point to tell them to keep it there um, so that the image comes out uh, more diagnostic. So you can kind of see these are pretty poor quality, I feel like, but you can kind of see this really big, dark Base right through here. This is a very obvious palatal glossal. And notice how it's totally obscuring all the apices. It just wipes out hard tissue, just wipes out everything that, so you really can't see anything. But this person is a dentalist, but you can see there's a big dark space here. So they didn't, um, they didn't keep their tongue on the roof of the mouth. Um, okay. And then this is a picture of a um, PD, this is a pediatric, um, Piano, and we're gonna talk. I have to figure out a place to fit it a little bit better. We'll we'll do it um, when we talk about Carrie's interpretation because we'll look at pedo films. But one area that students typically struggle is when they go into. I think it's is it summer or is it fall senior? I can't remember. And they start to um, go through the OSCEs. 
a lot of times they struggle with the pedo films because you don't take a lot of pedo films, especially your junior year. Um, you don't see a lot of pedo in general and you don't see a lot of kids and you don't take a lot of films. And so you just don't get, you, you get a lot more used to looking at adults and Terrio and that sort of thing. So I'm going to try and fit in one of our labs, just some practice with pedo bite wings um, and pedo films and a piano too, like naming teeth. Um, and so, but this is what it looks like. And you can see that one of the main differences here, not only is it just a smaller face in general, but you can see all the, the um, adult teeth behind the primary teeth. So obviously there's just lots of teeth and you can go in and see which teeth, you know, if there's any teeth that are missing or if they, you know, are going to have a, an issue. So usually dentists like to take a panel around six or seven ish and then maybe again at 12 and then maybe again closer to when their pant their uh, wisdom teeth are going to come out and that's totally just depends on the dentist some you know will just do six and wisdom teeth age and it just depends but they usually like to see what's going on okay so some anatomy basics here so this is really important this will definitely be on a quiz or an exam so you want to understand the the um, density differences and how uh, those differences affect your image. So air spaces, palatoglossal, nasal pharyngeal, oral pharyngeal, all of those air spaces, and there's only three really that you have to memorize, just those three air spaces, they obstruct hard tissue. So in some of the images, you'll be able to see the air space and then a faint, you know, like the ramus, you can still see the ramus, but it's just more faint. Um, so because that air space is obstructing the hard tissue. So that's why air spaces obstruct the apices of the maxillary teeth if it's, if it's there because it, it just kind of blocks it out. So air obscures hard tissue. Soft tissue, though, obscures air. So you can oftentimes see like the soft palate within an air space. So soft tissue doesn't necessarily go away. The hard tissue goes away within those air spaces. So like you can see the soft palate, like well, I said that already. And then hard tissue obscures soft tissue. So if we're not dealing with an air space, hard tissue is denser than soft tissue. So hard tissue will, obs will obscure the soft tissue. And then a ghost image, which is gonna be the most dense of anything because it's gonna likely be metal, is gonna obscure everything because it's just gonna be really bright white and it's gonna cast its shadow. You can kind of think about it as a shadow, the ghost image. Um, so it's gonna obscure all of it. <gasps> I'm doing so good. It's like 30 minutes in. Okay, so get up, turn around, run around, do something for five minutes. If you wanna get out, stretch. If you wanna go use the restroom or take a drink, but I'm gonna start in five minutes. So. I'm going to, it's 28. Okay, so we're going to keep going here. Okay, so now that we kind of have the basics of how to take, maybe not how to take it, we really haven't quite gotten that far. But now that we have the basic sort of of what's happening with the film, um, now we're going to look at the normal anatomy that you would want to see. Um, and then we'll talk, once you kind of know exactly what you should be seeing in a panel, then we'll talk about patient positioning and a little bit more about that detail. So we're going to go over at the anatomy. So this is all like really important stuff that you're going to be tested on. So I, I know it's a lot to absorb in one sitting and we'll, we'll go over this in lab and, and practice. But um, so these, so I'm just going to say a lot of this stuff. Um, and so you're just going to hear it, you know, one time and yeah, I am, I am. Thank you for checking. Um, I am. Yeah. So I'm going to just say it. And then of course you can re-listen to it in the recording. You, I'm going to give you like sheets to like fill in the answers and you just repetitively, you know, practice this stuff. So this is sort of an overview. This one in particular, there are a few things that you're not, I try and go through and highlight the things that you're not going to be tested on to kind of eliminate them. So you don't have to worry about memorizing them. Something that doesn't necessarily 
frequently show up in a piano or something like that. But some of them are just sort of snuck in here. And But this is just an overview. I'm not going to necessarily, like the mastoid process, for example, this is not necessarily one that I think is like on the landmark exam. So this is just right off the bat, an example of something um, that you aren't necessarily going to see the mastoid process. But what is close to it that you absolutely will see on an exam is this um, styloid process or the styloid ligament, it's sometimes called. Some of these have more than one name. Um, so I try to stick to just one name. But if you see it in different sources, you might see it uh, listed slightly differently. So this, my uh, mouse keeps falling, disappearing. But so this is the styloid process. Then we have the external auditory meatus, or you might see it as the ear canal. Some of them might put it as ear canal. And you see this quite frequently on a piano. Um, number four is the glenoid fossa. That's where your um, condyle rests. So it's this, it's this indentation. So this indentation here is the glenoid fossa. And as you open your mouth, your jaw rides up onto the articulating eminence, which is number five. So our, the articular, I said articulating, whatever, articular eminence is um, number five. So that, so these two, so two, three, four, and five are all um, ones that you will definitely use. I'm not sure what number six is. It's not even listed. And I don't think you necessarily have to worry about that. Um, number seven, I don't think we have to worry about that. Number eight is the maxillary tuberosity. That's just that bone that's past the last, um, the last maxillary molar, that kind of rounded bone that goes up on either side of the maxilla. So that's your maxillary tuberosity. And that's here. Um, and then it's back over here. It's kind of obscured by whatever this blue part is. Um, number nine, what is nine? Is it even on here? Oh, it's a foramen. It's like an infraorbital foramen. This one actually, it, you don't have to know it for this class, but that one you're gonna have to know for anatomy and physio or anatomy of local anesthesia when you give the IO. Um, so that, but you don't have to know that's, it's not here because of, because we don't test on that. Then number 10 is just the orbits. So what sometimes people get confused on is the orbits and the maxillary sinus. So the orbits are gonna be a higher up on the image and they're gonna be bigger. Um, so just kind of think about that's where your eyeballs, so it looks like the skull's eyeballs are basically, or not eyeballs, but you know, the space where the eyeballs would be. So that's the orbit, so that's number 10 here and here. And then incisive foramen, we don't, I'm not gonna test you on that for the pano. You will get tested on that, I think, for our intraoral um, images, I believe, but not on the pano. But that's number 12. Number 11 is something else that we're not gonna test on. I'm not sure what that is. Um, 13, anterior nasal spine. This this you're gonna see on the pano. It's, so this can be a little confusing because when you think of a spine, what would you think of? something long, right? Like you think of something long, but the anterior nasal spine is just a little triangular projection of bone. And you, have you guys gotten that in another class yet? So it's, it's the end of the nasal spine or the nasal septum is the nasal spine. So it's super easy to get those mixed up because when you think of a spine, you, you think of something long and straight, but it's really all it is is this little projection, this little V-shaped projection down here, number 13, that's the anterior nasal spine. It's bone. You can see it on a skull. It kind of like pokes out a little bit. So yeah, it's it's bone. Um, okay, so that's 13. 14 is the nasal cavity and the concha. You will not always see the concha. The concha is the swirly the swirly bits here in between, but the the cavity, the nasal um, cavity, you will see quite often. And we'll see it a lot in our intraoral photos as well. Mm -hmm. We'll point out the cavity. And it's just a kind of a radial lucent area in around the nose area. The na now the septum, the nasal septum, this long, these are the two people get mixed up. They mix up the septum. They mix up the nasal septum with the nasal spine. So just star, 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 
The nasal septum is long. It's in between the nasal cavities. And at the end is the nasal spine. And I just don't think that's intuitive. Does anyone else agree? <laughs> I just feel like that just seems like they should mix up the terms a little bit. But that's what it is. So I want to make sure you are right, you know, you're um, getting that down so you don't get them confused. So 15 is the nasal um, septum, 13 is the nasal spine. And then on 16, we have the hard palate. So that's coming through here. It's coming through the sinuses. It should be well above the apex of all the maxillary teeth. Um, so that's the hard palate. 17 is the maxillary sinus. A lot of times what, what I will be pointing to is the floor of the maxillary sinus. Um, so that's the area that's like right, right above the, the apex of the maxillary teeth. So that's, it is a whole, there is a whole space this is the maxillary sinus, but a lot of times we're sort of calling out the floor, the, the bottom part of it. That's kind of what we're pointing to because that's sort of what shows up as radiopaque, obviously, because that's where the bone is. Um, so 18 is specifically saying, so the whole green space here is the maxillary sinus, but 18 is pointing up, to, pointing to the floor. Um, 19 is the zygomatic process. These can be hard to see on the... Um, Cano, the zygomatic process, and then the zygomatic arch is 20. So it can be a little bit, you, if you notice here, how this kind of comes down like this, and then it kind of comes it to a point, sort of a V. So that would, this is what would be pointed out as the zygomatic process. And then as we go back and the bone sort of thickens up and then comes back this way, it's the um, zygomatic arch. So those are just a few things. That is not it for anatomy. Those that's just one slide. So this, um, but a lot of those on this slide are things you're gonna want to you're gonna need to memorize. So here's um, we'll pick out a few things in each each uh, couple of films here of different things. So um, I do not know why at all they used this for the auditory meatus because I feel like maybe. You can see it better over here. I, this is a poor, poor example of an auditory meatus. You, there's way better ones, and we'll point it out as we look at a little bit later. But in general, the auditory meatus will be in this area. The zygomatic process of the maxilla, you can kind of see. I wish I had a. I wish I could draw. I wish I had the little tools that you guys have with the. That would be so much nicer. But you know, see how this bone sort of comes down at a point as it slopes down? So here we have the zygomatic process and the arch is back here. So just like we saw in the, in the drawing on the previous slide, but so down here. So number two is pointing to the zygomatic process. Four is pointing to the orbit. So we have the orbit up here. So up here and up here is the orbit. Number five is the anterior nasal spine. That's gonna be, it's kind of obscured a little bit. We're kind of lost it from um, some little bit of the spine, the real spine, like the neck spine is getting in the way um, of in this image, but that's where the nasal spine would be down in here. And then the nasal septum is gonna go up through the nasal cavity. Then we have the hard palate, that's the white, you can see soft palate off to the side, but that's not listed here. And then the zygomatic process is nine, which is, um, it kind of looks, well, how did they separate? Oh, they put the top part here for the zygomatic process and then different part of the zygoma. They, so this is split, splicing out the zygomatic in different sections. Um, I'll try to, when, especially when we're reviewing for the exam, I'll try and give you the same image of what, it's gonna look like on the exam. Because you, you, there's quite a variety of different parts of the zygomatic um, arch and process and things like that. And it's, it's like, okay, is that it? Or is that it? What do, you, you know, what do you want me to remember? So I'll get a little bit more specific after we go through the um, intraoral films. And um, then on this one, we have the um, articulating eminence here. Um, the glenoid fossa, you can see the condyles resting in the glenoid fossa, and then number one is pointing to the condyle. So the, this the, looks like a thumb, the bone that is um, that part of the mandible, that's the, um, that's the condyle, it's resting in the 
eminent, the glenoid fossa, and then this is the articulate uh, eminence, articular. I keep wanting to say articulating, so I think I'm thinking of biting, but the articular eminence is number two. Um, number three is the maxillary tuberosity. You can see all you really see is sort of like the outline of the bone coming off of the maxillary molars. Number four is the um, sinus here. You see sort of the floor of the sinus over here and the floor of the sinus here. And then the sinus space is sort of all up in this area here. And then the zygomatic process um, is hard to see on this one, but it kind of goes up through here. And again, you can see the hard palate here. You can see the soft palate. Um, those are pretty easy to pick out. And then these are the orbits up here. You can see the bottom, the floor of the orbit here and here. You can see that. And then this is the sinus area down here. Okay, so some other features. We have one is the condyle. Two is the mandibular notch, or it could also be called the sig sigmoid notch, mandibular notch or the sigmoid notch. Um, number three is the coronoid process. Um, and it's it's a little bit more shaped, like a little bit sharper of a triangular projection of bone. The condyle is rounder and the coronoid process is a little bit more triangular. Um, the mandibular foramen is number four. That's the opening. We have a nerve that runs all the way down our mandible and that's what you're gonna anesthetize with the inferior alveolar injection and the top of that opening which you're trying to get to is the mandibular foramen you're trying to get to that opening so the anesthetic gets down and, and blocks that nerve so this is this is the foramen that you're trying to get superior to hopefully so that you can um, block that nerve um, so that's number four is the mandibular foramen number six is the mandibular canal you're going to see this on PAs, you're going to see it on your um, your pano. So this is the canal, and then it ends at the mental foramen. And so that's that radiolucent, round radiolucent area by the premolars. So a lot of times uh, you have to be aware of that location so that when you're looking at a film, you don't think it's an abscess. If it lays, you took the film and it looks like it's laying over at the apex of the premolars. So that's the mandibular foramen. Mental, thank you. Mental foramen down by the premolars, mandibular up at the top. Inferior border of the mandible is 13. So that's just your bottom of your mandible. Um, and then 15, 14 and 15, there's internal oblique ridge and external oblique ridge. This is a lot easier to see. Um, like I wish I had a skull so that you can like pick it out on the skull. But basically when you when when you're looking at a radiograph, the, the bone that looks like it's coming right off of the back of the mandibular molars, that's your external oblique ridge. You see that when you're looking at your bite wings and you're trying to figure out, you know, when you're trying to figure out which was the bite molar shot and back, now you know that super well, but when you're first trying to figure it out, what's the molar shot, what's the premolar shot, that external oblique ridge comes right off the molars. Then the internal oblique ridge, it's more, internal, thus, you know, the name. So it's more lingual, you could say, and it comes down and then the bone comes down in front of the molars. And so the bone is thicker there. And so it just kind of like branches the way it looks on a film is they're kind of coming together. And then one kind of drops down lower and goes over the, the roots of the molars. And it just looks more radiopaque. And we'll point that out a lot in the PAs. But so you have your internal oblique ridge and your external oblique ridge. Um, so here, number one is the condyle. Number two is the mandibular notch. Number three is the coronoid process. Again, this is not a fabulous picture. It's kind of obscured, but the coronoid process comes up on this side and the um, condyle on the um, closer to the edge of the film. Number four, the mandibular foramen, um, mental foramen down by the premolars. Mental ridge is going to be down by the chin. Styloid process is close to the soft tissue of the ear. So it usually just looks like a sword. Um, it's usually within, if you can see the soft tissue of the ear, the styloid process is within the soft tissue of the ear. 
Uh, number one, again, we have the mandibular canal down, running down the jaw. You kind of, it's going to be more radiolucent. This is the submandibular fossa. It's where we have a salivary gland. You see how it just looks more radiolucent right through the molars, the apices of the mandibular molars. That's not on here, but you do need to know that. So you could write that in if you have one of those iPads. Um, but it'll be on other uh, other films as well. We have the hyoid bone, which is going to be, it usually looks like it's floating below the mandible. That's the hyoid bone. And you get a, a double real image of the hyoid bone. The internal oblique uh, ridge comes down. Um, it comes down here and then it comes down in front of the, the molars. And then we have the angle of the mandible, which is kind of self-explanatory, just right this area here, the, the angle of the mandible. Um, inferior border of the mandible. So this would be this part here, the inferior border of the mandible. Submandibular fossa, see how it's more radiolucent? The bone is just thinner there. You can kind of put your tongue into that. If you kind of stick your tongue down into the sides of your mandible, you can kind of, sometimes you can feel like a dip. I can, because I have a lot of extra bone, so it really goes in. But um, so that's your submandibular fossa. And then your external oblique ridge comes right off of the back of, it looks like it comes right off the back of the molar. Um, and then soft tissue of the ear is not great, but they're saying that they, Sometimes you can really see it. You can kind of see it here, I guess, too, on this side. Here's an external auditory meatus. That, see how it's a nice, dark little orbit? That's um, nice and obvious right here. So that's your external um, auditory meatus, and then the soft tissue of the ear is through here, and I guess through here. This is the other external auditory meatus, but it's not as clear. Okay, so this one I went through, I wonder why I can't see it as well. In this, um, I highlighted, hopefully, hopefully you can see this better on my notes as I have it in presenter mode. I went through the landmarks that I want you to know and I, I bolded them. And then the landmarks that you don't really have to know I just left unbolded. So I'm not seeing that in my notes. So hopefully you guys can see that on your end. Didn't you see it? Okay, thanks, Um, They're not bolded. They should be bolded. Are they bolded on your? Maybe I, re I updated it like before class. So maybe you're looking at one before it was Oh, no, no, they are not bolded. No, you're right. That. So as I went through and just like highlighted the ones, so I have to, I'll figure out why that is. In the notes, bolded. So not, so you have like landmark one, two, three, four, five, and then only some of them are bolded. You have it? Mine aren't bolded. I just downloaded mine. And it's not? Maybe not on the first one? Oh, they are. Oh, I see it. I just had to, I just had to advance one slide. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Um, so I, so that means that they're all important on the first one, except for the ones that say, does any of them say not important? I can't. Okay. Anyways, we'll just go through here. So this is just repetitive, more of the same. So number one, we have the condyle here. Um, number two, it says the neck of the condyle. So I don't, th I'm not going to get that specific. If I ask you about the condyle, I'm going to point to the condyle. I'm not going to say, you didn't answer neck of the condyle. We're not going to get that fussy. Um, three, inferior border of the contralateral mandible. So this is trying to point out a ghost image. So um, I, I probably, so here you can sort of see how the line comes over and then it would go up like this. It's a little hard to see, but that's gonna be the ghost image of this border of the mandible. And then vice versa, here you can see the, the bottom part of it is a little clear and then it would go up and that's gonna be this border of the mandible. So that those that's just pointing out a ghost image for an example. Inferior border of the right mandible is number four, inferior border. Five floor of the orbit, we have up here and we have over here. That's the floor of the orbit. Angle of the left mandible, um, ghost image. Again, it's pointing out a ghost image. 
um, left external oblique ridge, left external oblique ridge. Where are we? Number seven. Oh, here. Here we go. Um, number seven, and then floor of the maxillary sinus here. And then you can see it also here. This is the maxillary sinus. And notice how close the roots are. Sometimes patients have to have what's called a sinus lift because their sinus is literally resting on the apex of their molars. And that's um, something that has to happen. Sometimes they have surgeries for that. Um, okay, so uh, the ones that are number one and two, um, I, di I didn't bold because it's like, meh. This number two zygomatic process, this is actually, pro I, I probably should go back and bold it because I actually do think that this might show up um, on a quiz. It's just that it's a little hard. It, it has to be a really good image. Otherwise, there are so many little lines that it's very easy to be like, which one exactly was the zygomatic process? This is actually a pretty good example of it. Um, so so I, I will go back and kind of make sure I have some consistently uh, the same sort of area. So that becomes a little bit more obvious because in other ones, I don't feel like it was as obvious. Um, number three, the hyoid bone that's down here kind of floats. It should not be touching the mandible in a in an ideal film. It should be below the mandible, but that's the hyoid uh, hyoid bone, bone. Nasal anterior nasal spine down here at the end. Um, number five, you don't have to worry about that one. Hard palate. This you can really see the ghost image of the hard palate. It's really separate. We have the hard palate, and then we have the ghost image up here, and that's that's really. Um, a good a good image of the ghost of the ghost of the hard palate. Um, number one, uh, the vertebrae, so cervi the the spine or the cervical vertebrae on either side of the image. Number two, inferior. I got my picture over it. Does that say zygomatic process? What does it say? Zygomatic arch. So this. You can see that it's thicker. So when we talk about the arch, it's going to be more bone. So the arch is going to be a, a larger, it's going to be a little bit darker, and it's going to be more bone. When we talk about the process, it, it'll probably look thinner and, and um, uh, thinner. So that's the zygomatic process. But um, the mental foramen down here by the premolars, the nasal septum going up from the spine, um, left pterygopalatine fossa, don't have to worry about that. Inferior alveolar canal, don't have to worry about that. And then um, in the center here, we have a shadow of the spine. So see how it's sort of obscured a little bit white? That's a shadow of the spine. Um, this one has quite a few you don't really have to worry about. You can see the earlobe okay, and you can see the styloid process and a really good external auditory meatus. You can see the styloid process really good. Look at how you can really see the ear, soft tissue of the ear through here. So that's a really good image of styloid, external um, auditory meatus, and soft tissue of the ear. Yeah, Mike, did you guys, did I go too fast? Are you, are you good? Everyone's good, okay. Um, this one is weird because there's a uh, deviated septum and like it almost looks like there's a tumor growing or something. So it, this is abnormal. You I wouldn't give you one that's abnormal. I would give you one that is more atypical. Um, but um, it's a concha bullosa, deviated septum, inferior turbinate. You don't need to know any of those. But like I pointed out, the styloid ligament or the styloid process is what um, the other um, sources call it. And then the this is pointing out the epiglottis, but you don't have to worry about the epiglottis. But I did want to point out how the hyoid bone is below the epiglottis. So the hyoid bone, you do want to um be aware of. So um, we, we showed, I showed you in the other slide, the ear canal, the auditory meatus, the right coronoid process. You can see how it's a little bit more triangular as it comes up through here, the um, coronoid process. The soft tissue of the nose um, is right through kind of like here, the soft tissue of the nose that doesn't always show up. And that's just a positioning error. Um, posterior surface of the tongue, uh, sometimes you can see the tongue right through this area, and sometimes it's very, uh, 
radio opaque, like not as much as bone, but it it look it's like looks like soft palate, but it's lower. And so that's um, sometimes you can see the tongue. Sigmoid notch number five or the mandibular notch. So we called it sigmoid notch, mandibular notch. It's the same thing. And then articulating eminence um, right through here that the condyle comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Like the soft tissue? You adjust the brightness. Oh, good. That's helpful. Yeah. So play if you feel like it's not clear, then play with the level of brightness and maybe it'll come in a little bit better. Thank you. Um, okay, so or oral oropharyngeal airway space. Um, so that's gonna be coming, so that's gonna be the, the one that's the lowest on your panel. So if you want to start from the top, it's going to be palatal glossal, nasal pharyngeal, oral pharyngeal. So think of it as kind of an arch coming down the side of your film. So number one is pointing to the oral pharyngeal. This is the nasal pharyngeal. And then this is the palatal glossal because they didn't put the tongue on the roof of the mouth. So it, this is an error right through here. And that's the only error. Remember, uh, the other um, air spaces are not errors. Um, what else is there? Lower surface of the soft palate. You can see through here and through here is the soft palate. You can see the hyoid bone really good. Superior, um, uh, superior, where for? Oh, this, this whole thing is the tongue, I guess. And it's that makes sense because it's not up on the palate, right? They didn't push it up onto the palate. So this whole kind of ra radiopaque-ish area is the tongue, superior margin of the tongue. Okay, so highlighting some things um, in different ways, just to see the same things, but in different ways. So we have our air spaces, we have the uh, palatal um, glossal air space, we have the nasopharyngeal. Sometimes you can really see this, this forking, kind of the two different parts of it, and then it all comes down into the oral pharyngeal. So sometimes you can see it really clearly, sometimes you only see part of it, it just depends on the patient. Um, so here we have the nasal pharyngeal and then oral pharyngeal. And I think it kind of, it almost sort of ruins it for these green segments because I, I almost would rather it just be the black and white and then like some arrows pointing to it because it sort of obscures it. I mean, it, it's highlighting it, but it's nice, would be nice to see how it looks without that there. Um, but you, I guess you can kind of see it through here. So the nasal pharyngeal through here and then the oral pharyngeal. And then the palatal glossal up here. And so this is just showing you, this is a really good example of how the airspace obscures hard tissue. Because look at how white the condyle is and the ramus. But when you look at the neck of the condyle that's, that's in that airspace, see how light it is? So that's just a good example of how air, air spaces affect, they obscure hard tissue. So that's just a good example to see. Um, some other things, again, we have the tongue. So this, sometimes you see the tongue going off either side, the soft palate, and then the styloid process or the um, styloid ligament or soft tissue of the ear can also be in this area. So, and then that's just showing it in a different way. The tongue could come, the tongue could come all the way through the teeth and kind of come down the sides. And then the soft palate would be above the tongue, makes sense when you think about the anatomy and it'll be on either side. The soft palate will be on either side. And then the styloid process or the soft tissue of the ear can be in that general area. I don't think that's a very good picture of it, but that's sort of the general area. Um, doris the dorsum of the tongue. So that's coming through here. You can see how it's lighter right through here. Uh, the soft palate is a, a little bit above it here and here soft palate in the uvula, the soft tissue of the ear, they're saying is over here. You can see the articulating or the um, auditory meatus through up there. Um, the ghost image of the mandible, again, just pointing this out again, and then the cervical spine. You're going to see this a lot, the cervical spine, like a ghost image of the cervical spine. Ideally, we just we would minimize it, but it will show up um, quite often. Um, but again, you're going to get the contralateral. So you're going to get the ghost image shaped like this and then the real 
jaw angle of the mandible on the opposite side. So here it's kind of outlined the ghost image. So this is the ghost image of this angle of the mandible. And then you have a ghost image of the spine. Ready for a break? Okay, take a five minute break. And then oh, I think I'm gonna get through all the material. I'm so excited. Yay. Okay, five minutes. So like uh two fifteen or yeah, two fifteen. Um, let me look, hold on, let me pause the recording. And don't let me forget to start the recording back up. Oh, I don't forget. Okay, I am recording. And so now we're going to talk about, now we're going to talk about patient positioning, and then the errors that kind of go along with that. So we, um, this is next week in, next week, and next week in lab, what we're going to do is when you're at the table, um, the, we're going to um, do two at a time and you're going to do a, a fake pano. The machine, go, you have to position your patient. The pano goes around your head, but you don't radiate your, your partner. Um, so you'll do that for the table exercise. And then you get off the whole hour to just practice F FMXs, especially for those. I know those of you with x-ray experience might not be as excited, but People who, you know, I know all of these feel really rushed and like there's never enough time to practice, just practice and troubleshoot and practice and troubleshoot. So you have the next two weeks in a row, you get the full hour to just take films. Um, so that'll be a lot of opportunity to improve if you feel like you're just not quite up at to the speed of everybody else. But okay, so we're talking about patient positioning for the piano. Um, so Critical steps for producing radiograph of diagnostic quality. You want to make sure the machine is set to the right level. That's pretty simple. There's not a lot that would change. Um, you want to prepare the patient appropriately. You want to position the patient properly, expose the film, and then process it properly. Obviously, with digital, you don't have to worry about processing. Um, a few things that are absolutely vital that you know this stuff, like you have to know this stuff is when you're preparing the patient you want to ask them this is you're tested on this um, for exams and in proficiencies you ask the patient to remove all jewelry in the head and neck area that is including things like dental appliances and hearing aids hair pins that you might not see um, so anything that's metal you drape the we drape the patient with a lead apron here i know we already talked about that but we have a lead apron um, that it doesn't have a thyroid collar. That's very important that it doesn't because otherwise that'll just get in the image. Um, so you drape them with the, the lead apron in our clinic and then you um, tell the patient what to expect and you give them their step-by-step -step instructions of what to do. Um, it, the lead apron looks something like this. Kind of think about it like a, a, a superhero cape. So the, the longer part goes in the back and the shorter part goes in the front. So think about like a cape. Otherwise, a lot of people put it on backwards because you put your lead apron that you use in the intraoral images on the opposite way. So a lot of people, so when we're doing the process eval and you're being tested on it, lots of people get marked off because they put the lead apron on backwards. So just make note of that. Yeah. Because, because the x-rays come in from behind. So the, the sensors in front and the x-rays are coming in from behind. So, so the lead apron, so yeah. So like when you take a intraoral film, you're coming to the front of the patient, but when you take a pano, you're coming from behind. I always front of the patient that was around for like eight years. No oh, you had it. That. Nobody told you. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, and some people don't even use it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I'm sure there's different styles. Um, and note, obviously, there's no thyroid collar, so we want to be really careful about how high it rides up in the back and in the front. You don't, you want it to be really even um, on either side. Yeah. What do you do when the patient's practicing that they don't want to take out? So if they cannot take them out, so you kind of more say like, can you take that out for me? And if they're like, I can't. So if it comes down to that, then you have to live with it. <laughs> Um, yeah. 
Um, okay, so we're going to position the patient correctly. We're thinking about their anterior to posterior positioning. We want to think about their occlusal plane, like if their occlusal plane is um, parallel to the floor or not. You want their midline to be centered, so you don't want them to be their midline to be off. And then you want their spine to be really, really straight. And that that means you have to position them a certain way to get, because your spine is curved. Your spine isn't straight. And so you need to straighten the spine by positioning them a specific way. And then the tongue on the roof of the mouth. It's not rocket science, but if you don't do these steps, you're not going to get a good picture. I am. Thank you for checking. Always check. I try and remember, but... Um, so anterior to posterior positioning, when you have the patient bite down, this is a little side, uh, like a cross section of, or a side image of what the bite block looks like. And there is a groove that they need to put their teeth into. So if they bite in front of it, or they bite, if they bite before the groove or after the groove, it affects the image. So they need to, they need to bite in the groove. And that is surprisingly hard. I mean, it's it's so funny because you see people's like jaws like moving around, searching for the groove, and you're like, it's right there. But they, it's for some reason it's hard for people to find the groove. Is the groove end to end instead of like yes, they want to they want to do like maybe their natural bite, yeah. and so it feels odd. They're, so they're searching for it. It's like a hovering device. So, um, but this puts when they're in the groove, they're in that focal trough that we um, talked about at the very beginning. Um, if, and then it also helps um, to center their uh, mid sagittal plane and it keeps them from rotating because they're locked into a certain spot. Um, so anterior, posterior position, this is important to remember uh, this, these details here. Um, the, the teeth in the front of the focal trough are going to look shrunken if the patient bites beyond the groove. So if they come in and they go, there's the groove, and then they push they push past it and they bite past it and you don't notice and they you take the image, then the front teeth are going to look shrunken. There's more of a problem in the, um, well, in the anterior than posterior. And then superimposition of the spine um, onto the ramus. So you've just pushed the spine more close into the focal trough. So the spine, because they moved in too far, so the spine can show up in the image. So that's if they go, that's if they bite past the groove. And there's, there's, you know, I get, I think it can get confusing if you say like, you know, if you bite to anterior or posterior. So I always just envision the groove and say, did they bite before the groove or did they bite after the groove? So that's, I try to write the test questions in that format. So you, so that will let you know how to connect whether the teeth got bigger or smaller or what else has happened. Um, so if patient bites into the slit or groove on the plastic bite block, um, if, the, if they bite past the groove, then their anterior teeth will look smaller and the spine is more likely to show up on the image. Uh, if they bite in front of the groove, if the patient bites down before they get to the groove, then um, and then their anterior teeth will look larger and the condyle may, may be off the edges of the film. So they're, they're, they're kind of out, their condyle is sort of out of the focal trough and their anterior teeth are going to look larger. So this is all test question stuff, so make sure you're highlighting it. Um, occlusal plane. So the radiograph shows a gentle smile line. That's a key word that will show up on a quiz or a test question. You want, you should have a gentle smile line. Um, that's the correct occlusal plane. Keep the roots away from the hard palate. If they, if they're positioned right, they, um, there'll be a gentle smile and there'll be space between the apices and the hard palate. So this is a good example of it. You just see a gentle smile line there. Um, now for errors in positioning, if when you, you can, you can change the height, you, there's a button, an up and down button, and you can change how your patient's chin is. And if you, the best way to remember this is if you put your hands on your cheeks, if you, does, have you guys seen this before? If you put your hands on your cheeks and you put some pressure there and you pull your chin up, what happens to your face? You look kind of frowny. And then if you put your cheeks on and then you and then and then you look down, what happens? 
you get you you get smiles. So that's just uh, just do that to yourself and be like mm, brown or <laughs> creepy smile. So that's just a good way for especially for people who haven't seen this a whole bunch. You know that's a good way to remember. So if your chin is if your chin is up, you're gonna get um, a flat. The patient's gonna get flat. And if their chin is down, then they're going to get an, a, a more severe smile. So patient's chin, patient's head tipped too much down. You see this jack-o'-lantern kind of creepy smile. I mean, that's creepy. Excess um, curving of the occlusal plane, condyle at the top of the film. So now condyle's too far up. You get a very sharp V kind of creepy smile. And that's because their chin is down too far. How many times can I make this ugly face? Um, and then occlusal plane, patient's head not tipped, um, patient's head not tipped far enough. I don't think I like that. What does it say? I don't know. Anyways, if their chin is up, now we're going to get a flattening of our gentle smile or maybe even a slight frown. So occlusal plane is too flat. Image is distorted. Maxillary roots covered um, by the hard palate. Because if you think about it, as their, as their chin goes up, their maxillary teeth and your source is coming up at this upward angle. So it's going to hit the apex of the teeth and then the palate. So if you're, if the head is like this, then there, it's going to get the apex of the teeth really close to the hard palate. So that's why you want to, you want them to be nice and parallel. <laughs> so maxillary roots covered by the hard palate, loss of the condyle head off the images, off the edges of the film. Um, midline. So you want your midline centered, mid-sagittal plane should be vertical. So we want the, the midline to be centered. These little lights come on the panel and it helps you make sure that you're centered. So it kind of is a guide, but you want to check the light from behind the patient. So you're going to be here, like moving the thing, like up, down, everything. And you're looking at the patient, but when you have the good height of their chin, then come around behind them and look in the mirror and see if the lights are in the correct place. So come around and check your patient from behind to make sure that the lights are in the right place. Um, head rotation causes one side to be larger. And this is an example like what we talked about last week, how the tooth, the object, and the film should be close together to get a true accurate image. So when you're taking a pano, if you're not centered and one side is kicked off, the side that's closer to the sensor will be like a more accurate image and the opposite side will be big and blurry. So that's sort of like that principle in action when you're, if they're not centered on a pano, one side is gonna be farther away from the film and so it's gonna get bigger and blurrier. So it's that principle of object film being closer together gives a truer image. So the right side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, depending on which way they turn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, I didn't even know. Oh, it does ask which side is closer. So yeah, so if the left side, so if the left or the, the right side is more accurate, so then the left side, they moved away. Oh, no, I hate having to think like this. And my brain doesn't want to, these there's like word problems that my brain doesn't want to work out in the 30 seconds. But yes, you're probably very right, I'm sure, Lacey. Okay, so straight spine. So this is another thing you notice, the natural curvature of the spine. So we need to straighten that out somehow. And so there's a trick for that. Spine must be straight to minimize the shadow of the radiograph because very often we end up getting a, a, a shadow. And so basically all you do is there's going to be these little handles that your patient hangs on to. You just have them step forward like a good you know, maybe foot, like six inches or so, and then they're going to shoulders down and they're going to lean back. And so they're going to be at a little bit of a strange angle, almost feeling like if they weren't hanging on, they were going to fall backwards, but it straightens out their spine because then you have their occlusal plane flat and it just straightens out their spine. So they got to hold on to the handle so they don't feel like they're falling. But usually what you do is like, there's a good line that sort of is an indicator line in the panel room. And you just put your foot there and you say, step forward till you hit my foot. And then the patients put their feet there and then they lean back. Um, so no unwanted spine shadow, anterior teeth seen clearly. Um, in, this, in this image, the spine is not straight. You see a very 
white shadow of the spine. Uh, maybe a problem for a patient who's short, if they have neck surgery, if they're older, if they're in a wheelchair, that can it can be difficult to minimize the shadow. Tongue on the roof of the mouth. So we've seen several examples of the um, nasopalatine uh, airspace. So you have to be very specific with your patient. If you just say, tongue on the roof of the mouth, and then you run out and push the button, their tongue will not be on the roof of the mouth. So you have to like really talk them through it and say, you know, like put your tongue on the, the entire roof of your mouth and hold it there. And you can say like this says, like you're, you know, like you have peanut butter sticking your whole tongue to the roof of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Like you can give them like that, that image or that analogy so that they can and, and then say like, hold it there for the entire time that I'm pushing the button. So you have to really give them that instruction or else, I mean, so, so, so often they move their tongue. And if they swallow, like if you could say swallow and hold your tongue up there. And does anyone who's a dental assistant have a trick for that? Do they say something specific for their patients? Or is that pretty much what you say? Mm -hmm. When you swallow, you, your tongue goes to the roof of your mouth. So swallow and hold your tongue up the whole time. Um, okay, tongue not on the roof of the mouth. You're going to get this airspace. So you're gonna get this black airspace. Um, and then the Frankfurt plane. So the, there's a video in the Moodle page that you can watch. It was when uh, Director Copeland taught this course and she's in she's doing a, a demo with a student. Um, and she talks about the, um, the ala of the nose and the tragus, I think is what she talks about. So it's different than the Frankfurt, like the true Frankfurt um, plane but you can use either one of them. Um, but the Frankfurt plane should be parallel to the floor. So that's the bottom of the orbit. So you, it's gonna be different on everybody. So the bottom of the orbit to the, what is it? To the tragus? Oh no, to the ear canal, which is gonna be different. So, so to their ear canal, to their orbit. And that's just gonna be different on everybody. So you just try, and sometimes it's a weird, like, you're like, I, I'm doing what I thought the Frankfurt plane was, but it, you don't, your, your chin doesn't look right. Like sometimes intuitively, it just doesn't feel like it's working out. And the ala of the nose to the tragus is also different. So I always kind of say, well, let's see which one works better. And we kind of work it out in there on, on your partner. But um, the Frankfurt in the, just, you have to know those two different, um, those two different uh, planes and what they're for. So that's for also keeping the patient in the right occlusal plane. Mid-sagittal plane should be perpendicular to the floor. So here's the Frankfurt and then here's the, um, the a la tragal line or a la tragal line. Um, so bottom of the orbit to the top of the ear canal and then the a la of the nose. This is showing the top of the, the a la of the nose to the top of the tragus of the ear. So, it's, and it's similar. I mean, the tragus and the ear canal is similar. And then top of the ala is, and the, I'd have to look at a mirror to see if, how that would be different on me. But just, just that's just know that you're in this general area and you want to keep it, you want to keep them parallel. Um, expose film properly, correct machine setting based on patient size. Usually there's just an adult and a kid. You just adult or kid. Verify patient positioning. Ask patient to swallow. Put tongue on the roof of the mouth. Caution patient to hold still. And then you're going to go out and hold the button down the whole time. And it takes 15 to 20 seconds to go around the patient's head. Okay, so now we're going to do a few. Oh, shoot. Is this, I wrote in, oh, no. Okay, never mind, never mind. Okay, so what are some, um, what are some of the major errors that you see right off the bat in this image? Oh, I did. <laughs> I'm like, where? Oh, it it's because I did an animation. I'm like, where's my answers? But it's in. I did an animation. Um. So what are the what are the two uh two ones that should jump? They might not jump off the screen. We have just now talking about this, but how do you do it? Well, on what? On a pan on the piano machine. No, on who? On what? On. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I'm like, what do you think? So no, what we'll do. So next week, next week, what we do is during the table time, two of you at a time will go into the piano room, 
and then there is a test mode. So there, so you set up with the lights and the position and everything, and then you you go out and you push the button, and it goes around your patient's head, but there's no radiation that comes out. You're on test mode. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. So you won't see a picture. There's no picture to see. So the first real one you'll take will be on a patient. That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so what do you guys see? What do you notice here? What do you notice in this one? Tip down, chin down, kind of a creepy smile. What else? Yep. Nasopalatine, um, nasopalatine airspace. Good. And so there's, this is just a long-winded explanation of some things about this, but those are the two main ones, um, is the airspace and the chin is tipped down. Um, so patient motion, patient motion will also distort your film. So if their patient moves, um, if they just move once, you're gonna get like a ripple through the whole thing. If they move a lot for some reason, you're gonna get a lot of a lot of movement. So um, this, like they move the whole time here. And then here you can see one big movement, something happened, whatever it was. Um, so what about some errors on this one? What do you see? What, what, do you, what can you pick out on this one? The midline is off. Yep, you see how the ramus is pr probably more, well, it's probably a larger here and then it's thinner here. I guess this one probably is the more accurate side. And then what else do you see? Yeah, they have floating teeth. They have ghost teeth. So they have like a denture in there and it's pretty flat too. So their chin is in a strange position. But then again, they have dentures. So, you know, that's hard to see. What about this one? What are some errors for this one? Yeah, this side, the right side is way larger. So it's farther away from the screen. So they got that. So they have to move back centered, move their right side in. Um, left side looks more accurate, right? It, the teeth look clearer, especially this one. This one looks huge. Um, and then it's a little bit of a severe, um, it's not really a gentle smile. It's kind of a severe. And then the um, um, maybe a little bit of an airspace, maybe a little airspace right through there. What about this one? They moved. they moved. See this big ripple right through here? So they moved here, and it looks like they moved here again as well, because um, there's a kind of a lumpy bump there. But definitely they moved here. So the patient moved. Um, the hard palate is really close to the apices um, there, and they're not really, it's kind of looks more flat right through there. What about this one? So they left in an appliance, like a partial denture. What else? Mm -hmm, a big shadow of the spine. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering about this and this. And if that's, uh, I don't know. Anyways, okay. Um, all right, so processing films, this is all there is for traditional um, films because we just don't really deal with this very much. But um, the top film is obviously too light. There's no diagnostic, very little diagnostic value here. This one is very foggy. It kind of has this overall foggy look. And then this one that you can see some static electricity through there. Common technical errors. Um, so what is, what's the error in this film? Um, yeah, artifact. So you see a ghost image of the earring. That's a, a, a big one. And you see how it obscures a lot of anatomy right through here. What about this one? Yeah, this is a lead apron. So it's really, really, really radio paste. So the apron like is lead, so it blocked everything. So yeah, yeah. They're like, take out my thyroid collar. And you're like, shoot. But it actually happens in our, we don't have a thyroid collar on ours in our panel room. And this happens on our machine when the when the students don't um, center it. And if you get it up too high on um on the back, like if you bring it so it comes up here and then it and then the bottom. So you want to have it very centered. So it's evenly spaced on either side. Um what about this one? 
Uh huh. Palatable glossal, palatable glossal airspace through here. So that's that one. Um, and then what about? I know. I completely agree with you. I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's. It seems like I almost. I feel like they're identical. I don't see any teeth, but then again, it could be that the shadow of the, maybe they have a few front teeth and the shadow of the spine is like really over it. But I agree with you. This is terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the chin, the it's reverse smile line. Yeah. And their chin is off of the film, which would, which would put them. So yeah, so I guess that's, there's a few clues there, but I won't put that one on a test. Let's just put it that way. What's causing the exaggerated smile line seen on this piano film? Their chin is down. So there's they have an exaggerated smile line. Also, there's a separation between maxillary. And, there's no separation. That, so the teeth are vertically, um, angu there's vertical angulation because they're overlapped. Um, the anterior teeth appear narrow and blurred on this panoramic film. What causes that? so they bit past the group yep exactly too far forward um so the anterior teeth appear narrow so yeah so they bit past the groove and their chin is down too far and then what about this one anterior teeth are wide and blurry so they yep so they bit down before the groove or too far back I feel like the back and front can people can interpret it different ways. So I try to put, yeah, like those words, like before and after the groove, just because, you know, if we all learned the same terminology, but I'm horrible about keeping the same things. I say it differently every time. Um, okay, superimposition of the ghost image of the cervical spine may be seen in the center of the panoramic film. What causes this? So why do you see the spine here? Mm -hmm. They too, it can be because of their um, occlusal, but also if they bit too far in, uh, past the groove, you can, the spine can come into. Oh, oh, yes, that's the other good one. Sorry, I forgot that one. Thank you. That, so that one is positioning too. So if, if they didn't tilt back and their spine didn't get straightened, then it can show up. A shadow of the spine will show. And then the patient posterior teeth and the ramus appear to be magnified on the panoramic film when the head is not centered. What side, oh, this is another one of those. What side um, of the patient is closest to the film? So which one looks more accurate to you? The left side looks more accurate. So which one would be closer to the film? The left side, right, good. Um, identify ghost images so you can see there's, this looks like shrapnel, like they were, like maybe they were bird hunting or something, And but there's a bunch of metal in there, and you can just see they, um, all through here is the ghost image of it, you see all this just mess through there, that's all this metal, and then there's glasses, obviously they, they left who would leave? I mean, it happens. You get nervous and you forget. And then all of a sudden it's like, I took a panel with, and they had their glasses on. Um, and then common mistakes here. So we have um, obviously a bright white from the, their spine, but this is trying to show a real fracture. I don't know if you can, this is a horrible quality, but this is trying to show a, a true jaw fracture. And then this is showing something that looks like a fracture, but it's just that the patient moved. So the patient moved and, and, but it's not a fracture. They just moved, but this is what a true fracture would look like. Yeah, Allie. And that's it. Oh my gosh, you guys, five minutes to spare. I cannot believe it. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? So next week, next week, so there's several things on Moodle to be sure to look at. There's a, a, directions of how to take a piano. So I want you to come into lab next week having read through that. If you come into lab and when you do your, your patient, um, when you guys pair up and you do the practice piano, if you're like, I never looked at anything, I'm going to be disappointed because you have you should have read through it. So you obviously we're going to need to talk through it, but you should be familiar 
with the process. So that's an expectation to, to watch the video, read the, it says like Pano directions. And I think it says like study this for labs. So study that for labs so that you know how to, um, the basics. And then we'll go, you know, from there. Thank you guys.